we have been studying book of ephesians and uh, we have one more lesson that is left just before christmas we were studying spiritual warfare we have left two more to be studied and today we will look at one of the two the title of my sermon today is shield of faith that comes from ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 we will just look at a couple of photographs and then we will go into a discussion what you see on the screen is a roman shield now when we think about shield in the warfare we only have seen a small one but over a period of time the small one was not protecting the people so they developed uh, and the shield evolved into such a big one it looks like a door and that is the word that has given birth to the word shield in greek we will study a little bit more later it is the door of a house that is the shape it has you can actually literally hide inside the shield the next one is a fiery arrow we call it a flaming arrow or incendiary weapon it is uh, pretty long and at the tip they put uh, tow and pitch the tar keep it ready and when it is ignited and it burns it just shoot it when it goes it can actually damage bridges boats houses uh, big doors and it can also inflict heavy damage these are the two pictures we need to have when we look at ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 let me read the verse in all this some translations have the word above all actually it is not above all in all this or with all the other equipments stand firm the word stand firm comes from verse 14 by taking up the shield namely the faith some of us may wonder what is this shield of faith it should be translated as the shield namely the faith with which you will be able to extinguish quench or douse all the flaming arrows of the evil one you know prior to this one we looked at at least three weapons shoes belt chest plate they are supposed to be worn as a warrior all the time you cannot actually be unprepared you need to have the shoe as preparedness you need to have the belt as something that gives you the strength and you need to protect yourself with the breastplate but this particular weapon shield is not worn all the time but you put it when there is a need when enemy is attacking you that is when you need to actually put it on satan the evil one is trying to constantly inflict hurts on a believer's life the minute we became believers until then we were in the camp of the enemy at that time there was no spiritual warfare we were his friends and he was our friend but the minute we became believers the minute we invited jesus to be our savior and lord we changed the camp and we went into the camp of god and then immediately we started the spiritual warfare and uh, he knows that he cannot actually take us back from god's hand he knows he cannot actually win us over because our names are written in the lamb's book of life the salvation that is given to us it is forever 
but he can inflict damage in other words he will make sure that we are not stable and we are somehow stay in a state of being startled shaky here and there and he uses all sorts of weapons he is an invisible enemy but he uses vulnerable areas of our lives and he attacks us and there are a lot of vulnerabilities a small issue in our family personality issues in our family between husband and wives parents and children in the workplace in uh, uh, in our business and in our private life wherever there is a vulnerability he will attack so that we will feel defeated and we will remain in a state of being startled and we will be shaky because enemy is using all the techniques he is not visible he is invisible you know some wars that were fought and that are being fought even now they don't know who the enemy is it is almost like boxing in the dark and we box and he sees us but we rarely see him because we are not equipped to see him is something like the vietnam war where america fought against some enemies in vietnam and that was an utter defeat and that war never had a result it was a shame they had to move back and there are wars even now and people hide behind hospitals they hide behind schools and nurseries and you don't know who the enemy is because they are not saying they are enemy and they are not wearing uniform and it is difficult to fight this war so we need to actually refresh our memory about the enemy who our enemy is that is satan is he is an enemy or the enemy first peter chapter 5 verse 8 says your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour he keeps himself as busy person and we have become his enemy and he is our enemy he is a murderer john 8:44 we see satan was a murderer from the beginning he murdered through his lies not holding to the truth for there is no truth in him when he lies this is what jesus says he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies you know seldom people talk about enemy we become oblivious to it although he is fighting with us every minute but conveniently we just ignore this elephant in the room he is the deceiver revelation 23 the angel then threw him that is satan into the abyss and locked and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations until 1000 years were finished this is where we get the word millennium kilia greek word he is the deceiver he deceives what all deception he brings in our ways you know whatever we see in this world that is not from god is a deception we have wrong idea of beauty we have wrong idea of love we have wrong idea of security we have wrong idea of entertainment these are all deception from the enemy he is the intruder he intrudes into our family he intrudes into our schools in our politics it says in ephesians 4:27 satan is trying to take a foothold do not give the devil an opportunity sadly most of us if not all of us have given the enemy the foothold and he has a strong foothold in our families in our private life he is a schemer that's what we see in ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 
Satan is a schemer. This is the word, you get the word method. Methodology. He is always scheming constantly against believers. Okay, now I have thrown this weapon. Now let me use the other weapon and continuously he bombards. Paul calls Satan's weapon flaming arrows. It's a metaphor Apostle Paul A used earlier is a close combat. Uh, it was more like a wrestling. But in this verse, he moved the metaphor to a conventional one where there is an enemy camp and we are on the other side. And Paul says, metaphorically, the weapon he uses is a flaming arrow, fiery arrow, a javelin. The arrows are wrapped with tow and smeared with pitch. That is tar, black tar. When it is ignited, it becomes a flaming arrow which is shot in a distance of probably 30 feet. Flaming arrows were used by Persians to burn doors and bridges when they invaded modern day Greek. In those days, there were many Macedonia, Achaia, Sparta, those places. Now it is united Greece. When uh, Cyrus the Great founded Persia. Now, they had advanced military technique. They were in Iran, but they used to fight in Greece. They used to cross Aegean Sea, making floating bridges, and they would burn the cities down in Macedonia and Achaia. How? With these incendiary arrows. Later on, Greeks used such weapons in their warfare. Flaming arrows caused significant amount of collateral damage. If there is a huge uh, door which protects a city, they would just hit the door because that is the most vulnerable area and it burns the door down and easily people can go in. Flaming arrows not only inflict wounds, but they burn the object. It's a kind of horrible way to be defeated, horrible way to die. Flaming arrows can shake one's resolve and courage. Despite believers wearing the armors like the truth, righteousness and peace, verses 14 and 15, Satan still tries to inflict damage to believers with his flaming arrows. It is not enough to have the shoe, belt, and chest plate. But according to Paul, you also need to have the shield, that is the faith. Because enemy is trying to keep you unsettled. A lot of us are now unsettled. We feel defeated. We feel, man, we made wrong decisions. Man, we went to wrong place. And we have tasted wrong things. Somehow, a lot of us are unsettled. And he keeps us unstable. When believers come under Satan's fiery attack, they normally capitulate or compromise because they do not take the appropriate weapon. You know, they say, I'm going to fight God Sorry, I'm going to fight the enemy with my weapons, that is shoe, belt, and breastplate. But the minute they go out, they capitulate, easily given. Because he is very powerful. But he is not as powerful as God is. But when we go out without God-given weapon, we get defeated. We do not know how to use our weapon. Like Adam and Eve, the attack is on the believers following God's instruction. God said, you don't eat the fruit of this particular tree. But you have freedom to eat anything and everything here. But here is Satan. He asked this question. 
is it really true that god said then he goes on this is called deconstruction deconstruction is an attempt to bring what is constructed we teach our children in sunday school and we teach our children in school or at home a lot of things about faith and bible they go to school within a month they have not given birth to our children they don't pay the fees they don't really have any pain but they easily deconstruct them my son went to a school called texas christian university and uh, he has had an amazing upbringing went to sunday school studied bible every day within a month he calls me he said papa do you think the first five books were written by moses <laughs> you know what happens you are talking about seminaries i went to a seminary in 1991 to union biblical seminary i became a believer in 1983 and uh, i came for full time ministry in 1988 january 1st i was so strong in the word memorized scripture my conviction was so strong i used to take my tamil bible to my college when everyone else were enjoying in college i used to read the bible in front of everyone and anyone i saw on the road i would throw some bible verses to them you know in my speech thinking that somehow this bible verse would really have an effect on them i was so strong in my faith the first class new testament class my professor asked did jesus really say this or it is a concoction by the writers it is not one time it is not two times four years i was a very good student and i am so uh, academically inclined i went to another extreme what i was taught in the class was something that was deconstructing me systematically but i also went and read a lot of books that continued or facilitated faster deconstruction i became skeptical instead of being evangelistic i said i'm going to be emancipator of tribals and you know women instead of following the bible i was so fascinated with marxism and i finished in 1995 I came home I argued with my father-in-law I argued with everyone I said no this is not from God this is not from God and finally came to a place which one is from God For 2 years I lived double life from 95 to 97 because I did not know if I believed the bible anymore So I came to the end of it and I came to a place and I said God I don't want what I studied. I don't want deconstructionism, I don't want skepticism, I don't want humanism. All of them probably have a lot of good things, but I don't want anything that does not support the scripture and anything that actually does not build my faith. I don't want literally I cast out my seminary spirit. it is not the regular school that makes people go dry it is a seminary that makes people go dry they study and study and come to a place they said did god really say this and i would say 97 when i prayed god i believe what i need is genesis to revelation everything that is said is good for me my family and my ministry and also i said i don't want to be an emancipator i don't want to be a marxist i want to be a biblicist and i believe i was born again second time please don't misquote me because first time jesus became savior and lord second time i was released from the clutches of studies that have taken the world in a different direction when the whole world was going through 
an amazing evangelization germany bavaria and the surrounding countries were going through post modernism in 1800s and you know you see in india and other places christianity is thriving you go to western world i was in rome recently churches are empty hardly 1% of rome attends church on sunday they are all religious you go to france you go to germany it is the immigrant who fills the church it is not the people basically because it is the humanism skepticism and uh, all the things that came out of the seminaries which took people away you know this skepticism and rationalism and all these things did not originate in 1600s it originated in genesis 3 when satan came and asked eve is it really true that god said we can actually question one bible passage and say is this from god or it is a concoction believe it or not it is a domino effect it has a cascading effect it goes from genesis to revelation finally we come to a place we don't believe anything someone said if you believe it is not from god you tear the page and you tear the page finally you will come to just the two bookends from beginning till the end with nothing satan is a deceiver a schemer he is a murderer he is an intruder he is our enemy he is fighting a battle with you you know the battle right now is in schools in the place of intelligence in seminaries bible colleges i'm a seminary professor i'm telling you if you don't really teach the word there is no right for us to be seminary professors like aken the attack is on god's mission for his people god took this people from egypt to the promised land they were on a mission of god but aken was distracted with materials like a lot of christian leaders and preachers and pastors who started off well singing who is like unto thee who is like unto thee glorious and uh, powerful but later on they get distracted with materials power and position because satan works on them they are all victims of satan judges 7:1 says the israelites disobeyed the command about the city's riches aken son of carmi son of zabdi son of sera from the tribe of juda stole some of the riches satan just convinces you and i hey you are in god's mission but it is all right for you to be distracted with materials like king david the attack is on god's provision for the believers king david did really well he killed a bear in the name of god an ordinary shepherd boy became the shepherd of the nation and he composed a lot of songs but when success came to his head when security came to his land he said go out joab said no no we don't need to do it he said go and take census so that he could recruit people for his mighty army not realizing it is jehovah who is the lord of host it is jehovah who is going to fight for them so they doubt god's provision they think oh i need to do it i need to do it there are certain things we need to do it but ultimately it is god who builds the family it is god who protects the city like ananai and sapphira the attack is on god's plan for finance god wanted to support his the fledgling church with the support from believers but ananai and sapphira took a portion of it and lied to the holy spirit of god and they were rebuked 
because they were lured by Satan. Satan said, hey, anyway, it is your property. Why don't you take a little bit? And then you lie to the leaders. They did not lie to the leaders. They lied to God himself. Satan attacks believers' emotion, legitimate passion, and relationships, etc., etc. You know, we have emotion. And he attacks our emotion and we feel so discouraged and frustrated. We get discouraged about the other people, something that we cannot control. We get discouraged about people, the way they behave. If that is our vulnerability, Satan is going to attack us. And then legitimate passion. God has created us to be sexual. But he somehow said it is all right for you to have extramarital relationship. It is all right for you to really enjoy this outside of marriage. And then they say it is all right for you to just abuse the internet. Satan works in relationships. Relationship, they just do well, but somehow they don't bring the chemistry. Satan attacks. Satan came to Jesus with his flaming arrows. We see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 10. But Jesus defended with the expression, it is written. So beautiful. It is written three times, he says. Jesus teaches that scripture is sufficient for us, for anything. All sufficiency of the scripture. It is written. He attacked Jesus when he was hungry. He attacked Jesus when he knew that Jesus was going to be the king. And he said, why do you want to go all the way to the cross? Just fall at my feet. After all, you want the position. I will give it to you. And he wanted to somehow thwart the plan of God. And then he wanted to tempt God. In all of them, it is not any other weapon. It is the faith. It is written. Liberal theology that says Bible contains the word of God. You know, I am from the product of seminaries. And a lot of people preach from the pulpit with no conviction because they don't believe. And what is one problem in the world right now is weak pulpit with no conviction. They don't have conviction when they preach. Jesus deflected, defeated Satan, gave him a bloody nose just with this word. It is written. The term faith is used broadly in two ways. When we say Shield, namely the faith. Though the word faith is used broadly in two ways. The first one is the core collection of doctrines to which the true church unanimously holds. We call it the objective faith. That means what God has revealed about himself in the scripture, what he says about you and I, and what he says about the church and what he says about the future, despite who we are, it is there in the scripture, it is called the objective faith. The second one is when believers act on the objective faith or the collection of doctrines, it becomes the subjective faith. What we have in the scripture is the objective faith. And when we say, oh, this is what I believe, then it becomes a subjective faith. It's so beautiful. Let me illustrate here. When I was doing my PhD program, I used to have anxiety disorder, particularly when I did something called advanced Greek grammar. We were asked to reverse translate. You know, from Greek to English, you can translate. But English to Greek, we were supposed to translate. 
there were people who used to do it just like that but having gone from the seminary where i was where you know the language was not taught that strong i found it very difficult interestingly the professor would immediately pick on me subhash what do you think about it i used to hide and i used to really show that i am sleepy but still he would call me every day i used to have this anxiety and i used to think god what will i do if i failed you know do i have to change school is it all my study will come to an end so much and i went to a doctor a mental health doctor she gave me a medication that actually caused a lot of side effects i'm still uh, carrying the side effect because i did not know the doctrine of sovereignty god is in control god is there if god has taken me there he will give me the ability to succeed and i have had similar experiences when my son was finishing his 12th grade and i was thinking where will i go for money how will i send my son to school and i forced him to do several things and we went to different colleges and i had sleepless nights when i had sleepless nights i would really make my wife miserable children miserable and i used to have the pressure to my heart here chest and i used to cough and lo and behold my son finished with the no fees he had 100% scholarship now having understood the doctrine of sovereignty god is sovereign if he has called me for ministry if he had taken me there he would give me what i need you know all the situation we went through he knew he let us go through the situation and he also knew how he was going to fund my son's education but i was miserable i thought i had to take care of it i thought i had to finish my studies you know when we were starting the second uh, service i gave a bold face to everyone but within me i was thinking god you know what is going to happen to the second service we started you know if it doesn't go well as if the church belongs to me i used to be really disturbed but it is god who is in charge if it goes well it goes well we need to do what we need to do but ultimately it is him who is going to do it and it is not my church it is his church but we are called upon to work with him but the worry we don't need to do it he is the provider if he lets us go through a certain situation he lets us go through it he is in charge he knows everything he is sovereign so now i'm able to just rely on him there are certain things when i don't have resources when i have issues and i say god you are there and i'm able to now contain my uh, anxiety disorder so when believers act on the objective faith or the collection of doctrines it becomes a subjective faith we know this is the church it is god's body and god works so good uh, you know he w- uses every member their time talent and resources and i say you know if i don't really bring myself to what god needs for the church then i only know the objective faith but when i say i want to just come in the evening i want to be an usher i want to give my time talent and resources it becomes subjective faith one thing we need to be aware of there was a book that was published in the 80s i think it was in 84 called fourth dimension i would say single publication damaged christendom so badly it's called fourth dimension a korean pastor paul yong cho he wrote this and he said you can command god what you need and you just visualize everything and tell god what you need 
And he said, that is faith. And he said, the positive thinking drives Christians. It is absurdity. It is wrong. Faith is not that we generate. Faith is what God said about himself and about the world and about the church and what is there in the scripture when I believe it, that is faith. Faith is taking God at his word. It is not that we generate as positive thinking. So it is neither objective faith nor subjective faith. It is not from God. And we should not confuse the power of positive thinking with faith. Here in verse 16, both objective faith and subjective faith are included. Faith is believing what God has said in the Bible. If God said he created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh day, we believe and it is an objective faith made a subjective faith. When God says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, it is God said, and when we do it, it is subjective faith. When God said, I will make a way in the water, it is an objective faith, but when people just walk in, not uh, being afraid of water, that is subjective faith. You can actually put that in effect. You don't need to have a book, separate book to study about the faith, but scripture. In other words, faith is believing what God has said in the Bible. There are some uh, volumes that we need to have at some point. One is called Westminster Confession of Faith. I think it was done sometime in 1529, revised many times. And there are other confessional books. One of our church members uh, here has come up with a volume and he says, what is God? What is salvation? What is church? And then he asks a question and answers. It's so beautiful. We need to have those things. Believers cannot rely on themselves to fight the enemy who shoots fiery weapons. A lot of people become overconfident and they go out and they get hit so badly. A soldier fighting in the battlefield without a shield remains unprotected. A lot of us are unprotected because we don't know our faith. Because there are some churches that are very good in taking out our comprehension. Somehow they have put some crafts in and what happens is People are not able to read the scripture and they keep them in superficial faith. One such thing is prosperity gospel. They think God is there only to bless you, only to give you money and success and position. And somehow they say, you give money, you just do this, you get it. And make Christianity a twisted religion. Faith is what God has said in the scripture and when we believe it, it becomes our faith. And I was told, I was disturbed. There are some pastors in the city of Bangalore, in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh where they come and sit in high chairs and people kneel down with their hands extended like this and worship the pastor. They are enemies of cross, they don't know the gospel. They are using the vulnerability of the people to fill their stomach. They carry big, big positions, titles, go around. And actually, they are not serving God. They are serving themselves. We as a church be equipped to identify those people and call them who they are. A soldier Fighting in the battlefield without a shield remains unprotected. Are you exposed to the incendiary attacks of the evil one? Has the evil one inflicted wounds in your life? Have you capitulated? Have you lost your courage? Are you startled in any way? Basically because 
you have gone from one place to another. Every wind of teaching, you have gone out. You need to be firmly rooted in God's word. Knowledge of the truth and acting on them makes believers remain successful in spiritual battle. The way you can continue to defeat the enemy is a knowledge of the truth and acting on the truth. In time of Satan's fury attack or, you know, incendiary attack, believers must take the shield, namely the faith that extinguishes the flaming fire. The verb to take points to the believer's initiative. It is not that God is going to come and give you the shield, but God has given you the armor. You and I need to use it whenever there is a fiery attack from the enemy. In fact, the fiery attack comes all the time. Discouragement, frustration, and uh, abuse of relationship, abuse of our provisions. And believe it or not, if you are a Christian and if you are a full-time minister, you get bombarded. The verb to take points to believers' initiative. You need to take it. It is not always put on like the other armors, but it is taken only when it is needed. Knowledge of doctrines as they are taught in the scripture is important because they come handy all the time. The word shield comes from the word for door because of its shape, the rectangular shape. In some sense, you can say the door protects you from the attacks of the enemy. The shield Paul has in mind is called scutum. That is a Latin word, which is a large rectangular or semi-cylindrical shield. It is different from the regular one. These shields are soaked with water to extinguish the fire. The shield is made with too strong wood covered with the skin of calf. And they just soak it with water. Any amount of fiery arrows, they come and hit and they fall down. Sometimes it gets deflected. And you can advance towards the enemy to defeat him. For a Christian, the scutum is the faith. In the, the slide, you don't really get the definite article the way I have it here. I have make, made it bold. The faith. It is not a faith. The faith. That means... It is a collection of doctrine from the scripture. It is the collection of the core of our faith. Or I don't need to work towards salvation. And it is God who is taking me through this journey. I am dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God or indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. See that the definite article shows there is a specific faith that is in mind. So take up the shield, namely the faith, that means that is a specific faith. What amazes me now is any faith and every faith. There are some people who don't even touch the Bible. But they say this one, I believe what I believe, this is the word I need, everyone repeats it. And afterwards, they put it here, never uses it. And I don't know if they use it at all in their private life. They don't. And they talk about the trolley in the parking lot. They talk about giving lift to the people. No! Pulpit is to speak for God and letting God speak from his word. It's very, very important. The faith here is once acting on the objective truth. In other words, believing, laying hold of God's resources is the faith. You know, you are going to really negotiate a lot of decisions. How to work with others. How to relate with my spouse. And how to handle my finance. Where 
you have an objective faith you act on it that is the faith that we need believing what god has revealed about himself and matters of his relationship with us in the scripture is the faith faith is not generated within human being some people say oh i have more faith therefore i have a big house you don't have faith therefore that's wrong you know what is the faith that we are talking about god has changed your status from sinner to saint and the evil one continues to accuse you oh you are a sinner some people even pray like this father i am not even worthy to stand before you actually that is wrong we are making god a liar god says you are a saint because you accepted jesus christ as your savior and lord and your name is written in the lamb's book of life your sin is removed as far as the east is from the west that means you are not a sinner you are a saint you are addressed as holy people but somehow satan comes and tells you oh you did something yesterday you lost your salvation you you were a saint yesterday but today you have become a sinner it's wrong god has changed your status god has adopted you according to ephesians 1:3 and he never retracts from his relationship with you this is called an orphan mindset when god says i have adopted you in other words he is adopted god doesn't tell lies you know the very fact you are sitting in the church the very fact you are addressing god as father is because he adopted you he never retracts and he doesn't take it back he doesn't go and just take your name out of uh, the lamb's book of life although there is a warning there it's not that he is doing it but the enemy comes and says no who said that you need to work towards it somehow salvation they think it is meritorious god has destined to be holy and blameless when god has adopted you the purpose is you can stand before god 24/7 through the mediatorial ministry of our lord jesus to be holy and blameless god is holy and blameless when you are able to stand before him no one can accuse you as read in romans 8 if god is for us who can be against us the enemy will try to give all the wrong ideas to say man you are not holy god has redeemed you by the substitutionary death of his son jesus christ he has taken you out of the slavery helplessness but somehow say no you are not somehow we have you know it is almost like a cattle which is moved to a peg even after you release it it comes around the peg and that is what we are it is called the breaking of an elephant you bring an elephant from the wild and you just break the elephant and after that it stays where the mahot is a lot of us we are redeemed but somehow unwilling to believe it satan has blinded us god has given us the holy spirit to be by our side and an inheritance in the heavenlies ephesians 1 13 and 14 but somehow we think that we don't have the holy spirit we think we need to have the holy spirit some more and somehow people say oh you have the holy spirit only you only you demonstrate certain things even though that is not in the scripture that is what we say but we conveniently ignore second corinthians chapter 1 verse 23 ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 and when jesus christ said i'm going to go away now you are going to have a paraclete God has transformed us into a masterpiece so beautiful you are special but somehow we say no i am not special i am ugly look at me you know somehow we have bought into the lies of the commers it's operated by the enemy oh you want to be a good man this is how you need to be tall long cheek 
and you have to walk in a way. You are a woman, you need to have certain things that should be visible. Enemy is saying, this is how you need to be. But God says, you are a masterpiece. Which one would we believe? Would we believe God or we believe Satan? Satan is a liar. He's a schemer. He's our enemy. Anything that God has told about us, he wants to really twist that and say, you are not special. Someone else is special. The triune God is dwelling among us. It's so beautiful. The faith is the content that alters a person's behavior when he believes. You know, these days we need therapists. We need mentors. We need mentors because we don't read the scripture. We need mentors because we don't have a, an idea of the body of our faith. So we need someone to teach us. And we don't know if they teach correctly, but somehow we pay and listen to them. But you have a body of doctrine. And if we believe it and act on it, that alters our behavior. You know, worry, anger, greed, jealous or jealousy, all of them can be altered when we study the scripture. The word brings transformation. It is a word. It is not just a singing. It is not some kind of speaking ecstatically. Those things don't bring transformation. What brings transformation is the word of God. Word of God preached, believed. Being attacked or to remain in a defeated Christian state is because of a believer's inability to take up the shield, which is his faith. We somehow have kept the shield in a corner and we are walking around with the shoe belt and the breastplate and we get beaten up so badly, wounded, bleeding, capitulated, discouraged, basically because we are not using the faith. You know, we carry Bible, but seldom do we know the Bible. One day a person said, Pastor, I have 23 Bibles in my house. <laughs> okay, 20. Man, does that mean you read all 23 of them? No, we had to dust the Bible. <laughs> Every month they had to dust the Bible. No, we need to read the Bible, the old way of doing it. See, it is good to have the WhatsApp messages every day, the five minutes message. It's all right. But that is not a substitute. You know, it is good to have a pastor who controls. Now, I'm not saying good in the sense, you know, you may have many people who would be giving feeding. But I would say, please don't go from one pole to another pole to another pole. But it's not going to satisfy. Go to the word of God, the Bible. And study. And that is where it is. Being attacked or to remain a defeated Christian is because of a believer's inability to take up the shield, which is the faith. So I'd like to give us the takeaway. Takeaway is very simple. Seek to know the teaching of the scripture and learn to apply appropriately. 